Okay, everyone, uh, I'm really chuffed today to welcome Eddie Quinn on to the podcast. Uh, good morning, Eddie. How are you? Good morning, Kareem. Thank you for inviting me on the podcast, young man. No, listen, it's, uh, it's a thrill. There's, a, there's been a common theme on, on all of the podcasts so far that uh, I got a little bit of stick about because apparently I tell everybody that I really want to join the podcast. Uh, right. But... There's so many, there's so many people that I genuinely did want on the podcast, so I, I, I'm, I'm definitely not, not lying there. Uh, right, let's just start with some current events. Like how, how have you been finding the lockdown and stuff? This is something I've, I've pretty much been asking everybody and getting different, different responses to that. I've just had to diversify into. I've been selling online courses now for about three years. Yep, yep. And because my teaching schedule pre-COVID was crazy. I never really had the time to give to the online courses. Yeah. So with lockdown in, you know, at the end of March, it's left me no choice but to uh, to give that some some love and attention. So yeah. if I'm, on, I'm I'm one of these people anyway that always tends to find the the magic beans from a, a bad experience. Yeah. So uh, I've I've not really let let it get to me. I mean, you know, we have a you know, I teach self-defence in several primary schools in Solihull, in, just outside Birmingham, where I live. And, you know, me and my son and, and Super Nige, my right-hand man, you know, we teach about 250 kids every week. Wow, OK. Um, so that is a massive chunk of our business. Um, plus, it pays three people's wages. Yeah. So, it's, you know, it's been, it's been tough. Um, been tough more on my son, Jake, and, and Nigel more than, than me, because, you know, like I've been... I've been like diversifying and giving the online stuff um, lots more attention and lots more love. So um, yeah, it's been tough, but you know, I've been in worse places in my life. And well, you know, it's uh, let, let, let's let's sort of jump straight in there, Eddie, if you don't mind, because another thing that is becoming quite a common statement that I make is looking at yourself, and we've had. I mean, I had Jeff Thompson on a couple of weeks ago, which was which a thrill, which was a real sort of thrill to speak to. Jeff, Jeff Thompson used to come to my garage. I mean, it's maybe we can maybe we can chat about that sort of later as well. It, he's he's one of these people like yourself, but just like a top level martial artist. But it's your sort of background story that that I've been finding really interesting as part of this yeah. this yeah. podcast. So, were you talking about <laughs> bad situations? Let's sort of, let's kick off there. Now, you weren't involved in martial arts as a young child. You came to it. No, after- no, not at all. No, I was, I got involved when I was 19. Yeah. Um, I mean, most people who know me know the story, but I, I was drinking in my local pub. I was 18. And um, at, what happened was it was about quarter to 11 that night on a Friday night. And one of my pals came into the pub saying that your girlfriend, she was an ex-girlfriend, was being attacked at the bus stop across the road from the pub. Okay. And I was with my, my friend Alfie. So we, we ran outside. I'm sorry, I'm trying to choke myself with, my, right. <laughs> with, with my headphones. And um, we ran outside to, you know, to help. And as we went outside, there was, there was the three girls at the bus stop waiting to get home. And there was three lads waiting on, to get on the same bus. And um, as, we went, as me and Alfie went over, there were two lads involved. There was a big, thick set guy who had a sock with either snooker balls or um, stones in his sock. Yep. And there was a taller guy, thinner guy, who literally pulled out a flick knife. And um, literally the range changed very quickly. I didn't think the guy would use it. You know, I, I was young and full of testosterone anyway, and, yep. you know, fueled with beer as well, and thinking I was invincible. I didn't think the guy would use the knife. The range changed really quickly. and. Um, we ended up getting into a into a scrap. The, the problem was that every time that I hit him, and I didn't I didn't know how to fight in those days anyway. Yep, yep. Every time I hit him, he stabbed me, and um, as a result, yeah, I got stabbed six times. It's, I mean, it's, so it's quite a it's quite a it's quite a horrendous story. Uh, yeah, on, well, on, on its it, own, it, it, it was a making of me, really. I mean, in a very strange, perverse way. See, see, even already with what you're saying there regarding uh, 
using words like the range changing. Now that's that's quite a technical term as such, or something that would be like from someone like yourself who was a self defence expert or or a martial artist. But as a young 18, 19 year old, oh, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know, and, and, no. and maybe you're speaking from from experience there. But how how quickly do you remember that happening? I remember, you know. You're talking, I'm 55 next birthday. And it was 36 years ago, a couple of weeks ago. And pretty much, I remember everything. Wow, okay. Everything. Right. I remember the, the, the verbal. I remember seeing the knife. I remember trying to kick his leg. In, the, in those days, it was like the two-tone, um, you know, the special madness. I, I, was, I had my two-tone trousers on. Brilliant. I had, a, I had a pair of red brogues, I had a Ben Sherman shirt. <laughs> I had my favourite Ben Sherman shirt on. And um, I remember kicking his legs, trying to kick his legs to keep him away from me. Yeah. And again, you're talking to a guy who was completely untrained. Yeah. But I thought, I've got to keep this guy away. The thought about running didn't even come into my bloody head, which I preach about all the time. He's just don't be there and, and, and run away. But, yeah. you know, all depends on circumstances, but I got, you know, I can remember everything. And then I'm Alfie, my pal, he was, he was fighting the bigger guy. And, um, I remember seeing Alfie on my, I'm a it's weird. I remember seeing him on my, on my peripheral vision. He came running over and I went, no, Alfie, he's got a blade. Mm -hmm. And at this point I was pinned against the railings yep. and he was sticking his blade into me. And I went, no, Alfie's got a blade. And uh, anyway, as Alfie started to run, this guy ran off. And then everybody started coming out of the pub and everything else, bust up across the road. And the doorman, Big John, he came over and he, and he, and he laid me down. And all I could hear was my friends and everybody else saying, stay with me, stay with me, don't go to sleep, don't go to sleep. That, that thing out of a movie, you see? Yeah, of course. He's saying, don't go to sleep, don't go to sleep. I remember lying there, and I say this all the time, I remember looking up, it was 11 o'clock that night, and I remember lying on the concrete, looking up at the stars, and... I could see bloody blood coming out of my best Ben Sherman shirt and these holes. <laughs> but yeah. my breathing had changed, and that was a scary part. My breathing had gone from being normal to... <gasps> <gasps> and I thought, I'm dying. Well, it's well you've, you've documented this sort of... Even uh, what got me on to thinking about uh, this just the last couple of weeks is you shared... You shared a clip, I think, from a was it from the newspaper? Yeah, it made the front page of the Evening Mail. I, I think was a picture taken in the hospital. What? what yeah. Again, getting as graphic or, or as or as not as, as you're com comfortable with. Oh, it makes a long violence. time. It's water over, you know, what, water what, over the bridge. Yeah, what had actually happened to your body during that attack? Mm. Well, the reason it went on the front page of the Evening Mail was because they hadn't caught the knife man. Right. Okay. So they were hoping that on the front page it would get people to come forward. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got stabbed six times. I got stabbed in the right ventricle in my heart, my liver, my bowel, my gallbladder, my head, and my thigh. And um, so any one of those, any one of those, even even in the thigh, you know, you got your femoral artery in the thigh. You know, I teach. You know, I, I've taught a whole spectrum of people from infants to top military to kids who go to behavioral schools everything else and you know i get kids say to me eddie you know they get involved in gang violence and it's like where can i stab some this is serious on my kids life where can i stab someone without killing them it's madness you know and any one of those stab wounds could have killed me yeah. i shouldn't i shouldn't be here every day has been every day has been a bonus ever since my friend yeah uh, it's do you know some of the some of the stories that we've heard on the podcast so far have been just 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 crazy but you've hit the nail on the head there straight away regarding you one one of those stab woods could have been the end of oh, Eddie Quinn as a 19 year old yeah uh, yeah how long did it take you to recover from that uh, just even just sort of medically and then as you start I was in an, I, I was I was out of hospital would you believe in less than two weeks wow okay Right. Yeah, with all that, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, and pretty much, if I'm honest with you, I mean, you're talking 1984, and I was young, and the doctors there was no there was no there was no counselling in those days. 
there's no going to see you shrink. It was, you're young enough. Just, just get on with it. Yeah. Just get on with it. So, um, you know. Was that something you were able to do, looking back, sort of 30-odd years? Yeah, ago? pretty much. I mean, you know, for the, my, my old man had just died. Um, I got stabbed in November. Dad died. He had a, dad my age, 54, he had a, he had a massive heart attack. So dad had just died anyway that you know, earlier that year. So it was a pretty crap year, as you can, as you can well imagine. Then I got stabbed. And, um, you know, I, I was literally just left my own devices. Yep. So, of course, you know, for, the, for the first few months, I was scared. Of, well, for more than a few months, I was pretty much scared of my own shadow. Indeed. And um, I had to go and see a heart specialist. He's the guy who changed, he's the guy who changed my life. Uh, he was a guy called Mr. Abrahams mm -hmm. and um, he said to me, he must have been in his 60s then and he went, son, have you ever thought about taking up a, up a combat sport? Right, okay. And I went, well, I've thought about it and he went, I suggest you have a go. So again, you know, 85, pre-internet, nothing there. Yep. All you knew about was like, you know, the odd karate school, even in the big city like Birmingham, the odd karate school, kung fu school, heard of judo so i heard i didn't know anything about martial arts at all i was 19 yep. and just in a really really bad place um you know, you know, recovering from 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 such a, a massive trauma and um my best friend at work stevie um one of his pals um had his cousin who taught a martial art literally three or four miles away from where we live and he said he teaches on a on a Tuesday night or Thursday night. Should we go and have a look? And uh, I went over and um, walked into this sports centre. Saw these guys in white suits, yeah, <laughs> throwing each other around. There was like steam off the on the on the wall condensation. All the windows were all you know misted up. And I just thought, wow, this is fantastic. And I told the the instructor came over. I introduced myself, told him what had happened to me. And um, I said, you know, can I come and join in? And um, I went back the next week, well, the next lesson, and that was it. I think... 30, what, what 35 I, years later. I think, uh, well, again, you've just said it. I'm just close my door. Here we go. I'll carry on. I'm, I, I'm multitasking, don't worry. No worries. Uh, 30. I'll let, I'll let you do that, and then we'll, 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 we'll come back. I'm back on board, mate. It's so, like the door was open. and uh, That's all right. There we go. I'm back with you now. No worries. All plugged in. Beautiful. Got you. 35 years uh, of a martial arts career. But I think we can, well, again, you tell me if I'm wrong, but it, can, it comes down to one comment from one person. So that doctor just put a wee idea in your head and then you thought, or were you thinking, did, did it ever come into your thinking that, I'm going to do martial arts or? No, no, never. It's... Never, not one iota. It's quite amazing. I had no inclination. It was just the fact, I think because I was lost, you know, dad was dead, you know, and my mom and my two sisters and they'd left, you know, they were, they were left. I was, I was like the youngest of three. Okay. So it was like there was 10 years between me and my next sister and then 13 years between the other ones. So I think I was just lost and looking for something and scared. Pretty much, even though I was, you know, um, a young man, I was I was scared of my own shadow. Yeah. And um, I was, I was absolutely hell bent on revenge. And that was eating me away because I was going to kill the two guys that were there that night. When I was when I was when I was in court, waiting to give evidence, my memory's terrible. And I remember, this is no word of a lie, I'm not going to mention their names, but I remember being in court, waiting outside the courtroom to go in and give evidence, and there was a file next to me. And I, peeped, I had a quick look in the file, and it had their names and addresses. Wow, okay. And I memorised their names and addresses, and I thought, when you get out of jail, I'm going to kill you both. And I was hell-bent on revenge absolutely hell-bent so you know literally i wish i could know that that doctor would be would be probably dead by now unless he's well into his 90s but yep. 
you know, that, that, that one man changed my life completely. And uh, if it wasn't for him, I think I, I don't know what would have happened. I'd have either drank myself to death or I'd have been in jail now um, for, for a double murder. Do you, maybe this is something that, that might come back up further, further down the conversation when we're talking about the different uh, styles of self-defense and martial arts and stuff that you've done and just all your experience. But I'll maybe ask the question just now. Do you, do you think back on that full situation from the minute you decided to leave the pub to being in that courtroom and how... Well, not really. It's like anything, isn't it? It's like, a, it, it's, it's like, um, you know, like a band that have been together for 30 years yeah. and, they're still, and they still have to play the hit that they, that they you know, that yeah. made them famous that they wrote 40 years ago. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I've got a great story. It's very inspirational for people to go that you can be in a really, really bad place. Yeah. And you can rebuild. You know, that that is great. But, you know, it's it's 30 odd years old now. And, you know, I've, I've, I've moved on a hell of a lot from there. Yeah. You know, I've got lots of lessons from that. Um, there's, there's learning in everything, isn't there? I've um, got loads of lessons from that, but no, no, not really. I don't, I don't really think about it. I mean, it's a constant reminder, you know. I've got a, I've got a, you know, I've got a scar from, you can see. Wow. Yeah. So the the from my belly button to the to the yeah. top where they they say you know they have to open me up. Yeah. Um. So I've got like a bit of a constant reminder whenever I take my top off, but yeah. you know, first thing in the morning for a shower and at night and stuff that that it's a constant reminder to me, but. It's, it's also something that, that made me get focused and turn me into the, the man that I am yeah. so today, really. What, uh, I, am I right in saying that the marsh, and again, I want to make a distinction here and probably we can, we can discuss this. What, the, the martial arts came first for you and then the self-defense, because do you, I, think, I, I think I was listening to a podcast that you've done recently with Matt Chapman, who we've had up at my own school for a seminar. And Matt's yeah. a lovely guy. Uh, so shout out to Matt. Uh, the great boy, he's really helped me out a lot. I'll, who, go, I'll give, you, I'll give by, you a shout out to Matt, bless you. Who, by the way, has been telling us all to get, to get ready for this day when we'd be teaching online, etc., etc. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, obviously, he didn't want it to happen under the current circumstances. Yeah, of course, yeah. He's, he's been telling us. And... You were talking about uh, the difference between self-perfection and self-preservation. Oh, you've been doing your homework. Yeah, I pinched that off. Um, yeah. There's a, there's, a, there's a Jeet Kune Do guy that I really admired. I know I still, still do now, but when I was like starting out my career, I mean, I'm one of these guys that's got a bit of an addictive personality. So once the doctor told me to get involved in martial arts, that was it. I'm yep. so glad I didn't do drugs. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, because, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So if if I've got a beam I'm, at the moment, I'm I'm learning I'm learning Malaysian, okay. But I'm 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 as structured with that as I am doing my own training. Right. It's like I I have to do it. It's part of my day every day. I have to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um. So um, what what where where was we going with this? The 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 the, the question was uh, you you would make a distinction now between yeah Paul Vuna martial yeah. arts and, and yes and yes self defense. Yeah. And yeah, you yeah. first in martial arts, obviously. Yeah, so I got really involved. You know, I went into that martial arts school, and that was it. It was like, I need to do this. But, you know, the guys were in white suits, and they were barefoot. And I'm a kid from the streets. Yep. And I realized that it was clean. It was too clean. It, there was, there was, I knew straight away that difference between being in the dojo and being on the street because I wear the scars. Yeah, of course. And I'd had, and I'd had a few, you know, I've had a bit of a colourful upbringing. Just the fact that we were just street kids and it was the 70s and 80s and all we did was hang around the streets. Yep, so yep. I, became, I was very street wise anyway. Yep. Um, so I knew the difference straight away between, you know, fighting in the dojo, training in the dojo uh, and, and fighting on the street. But I love the sense of belonging somewhere. Mm -hmm. you know I, my weight had ballooned up to 15 stone because I was drinking too much and eating too much shit 
So, you know, I went, I went into that dojo uh, overweight and, you know, within a few months, I'd lost four stone in weight. Wow. Yep. I gave up drinking and I gave up eating, I cleaned my diet up. You know, I became really focused on getting myself well. Uh, and, you know, I'm still, I'm still friends with Steve, my first teacher. Yep, yep. You, know, you know, 35 years down the line. Um, so, yeah, I knew the difference. And then Paul Vunak spoke about it. He, he brought out um, the Jeet Kune Do Street Fighting series, and I ordered it. It was on the old VHS videos. And he, he, he mentioned two things, and I, I, I pinched it. We all pinch from each other anyway, don't we? Let's yeah, face it. Of course. And he went, self-perfection is to do the art because you love the art, no matter what that art is. Yep. Self-preservation is to do whatever it takes to get home. Very, and very that, that, that was just, oh, that, was, that was the thing for me regarding training. I, you know. Do you know what? I, was, I, was, I went a walk with one of my students the other day and we were chatting about, uh, I'd said to him that, that you were coming on and the conversation then goes to, things we've taught in the past and self-defense versus martial arts, etc. And we were talking about running any, any self-defense class. And I'm not talking about a martial arts class now. Let's say a, a female-only self-defense course that you're running. And mm. it's just what you're talking about, about people having their, their white uniform and the bare feet. Everybody shows up in tracksuit bottoms and a T-shirt. Mm. Uh, the likelihood that you're going to get into a scrap is probably in as a female, maybe sort of a skirt or in high heels if you've been out in a night out or a guy yeah. in tight jeans or even whatever anybody's wearing. Uh, and, and we don't practice that way enough. We, we were discussing, we, we practice in our... So if I said to my class, right guys, Monday night, we're going to work on a wee bit of sort of street stuff. But everybody shows up in their dobok or their, 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 yeah. their uniform. Yes. Nobody gets attacked in their, their karate or their taekwondo yeah, uniform. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, we train yeah. that way. Maybe we're training wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I was um I was teaching in I teach in Norway every year. I've got um I've got a representative out there, Ola. And um Ola's ex military and there was a, a police officer. And the, the the when I go out there i teach it's it's like an invitation only just for military and police. It was like a scene out of Jack Bauer 24. <laughs> I got at the airport, I got picked up, I got taken to this industrial estate. There's a doorway, there's no signs as in Eddie Quinn's martial arts centre. Yep, yep. Just a doorway, you go in and it's a facility just for military and police. Anyway, I mean, this was, we're talking, I'm, I've, I've been out there four or five times now and one of the guys, Tommy, Tommy's an ex um, spe uh, Norwegian Special Forces guy. And uh, he does a lot of uh, a lot of talks now and stuff like that. He's like a like a like a mindset coach. Yep, yep. And anyway, what one session? Everybody was every, next day. Everybody was there in their training gear. If I'm doing some, if if I'm doing like sometimes just do, doing police, I'll get them in their in their kit. Yep, yep. But other times, like you said, lots of people just turn up in their trackies and stuff like that. Yep. So I was, I was teaching there one Sunday, and uh, Tommy turned up. I don't know him. We've you know we've been out to have of meals and drinks together and he turned up in a in like a, a dress suit jacket thing like a blazer yep. and i thought he'd been on the piss all night <laughs> and he rocked up to the he yeah. rocked up to the to the training you know that he'd, he'd, he'd not been to bed and he turned up and he's going out close anyway i went over to him i said you're dressed up for the occasion aren't you he went i was in i was walking through the city a few months ago and he said there was some girl getting attacked. I could hear screams. And he said I ran to where she, where I could hear the screams, and there was a guy attacking her. And he goes, I hammer fisted the guy. He said, but I fell short because my my coat. There you go. So he turned up for my seminar with his jacket on, so he could get the range better. And you go. We don't do that enough. I don't do that enough. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't do that enough either. We, you know? we we train in uniforms for 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 comfort. Uh, we train in uniforms for comfort, but the. Oops! What's happening here? Sorry, Eddie. Ooh. Carry on, mate. Uh, we train in uniforms for comfort, 
But we're never in that. We're never in that. Yeah, but but you're doing your you know, you're doing you're doing your art in it, aren't you? You know, I wear a sarong when you know I teach. I you know I train and teach traditional sea lap. Yeah. So you know we wear a sarong. So you know it's not as if I'm going to go out to the shopping centre with my sarong on. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But what? You know, let's talk. About, let's talk about the differences then. So this uh, again, you've been. So it's 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 uh, Sila and uh, Thai Muay Thai boxing. Yeah, I, I studied yeah. several arts. I, like I said to you, you know, I knew nothing about martial arts, and then I got, you know, interested. Went to my first class, and it was like, wow, this is fantastic. So started training that, and then I started to research different martial arts. I wanted to I wanted to be this all round martial artist. Yep. This guy that could throw, could lock, could could punch, could kick elbow, knee, could that headbutt, could fight on the ground, fight with a weapon, without a weapon. So I decided I wanted to rebuild my life through martial arts, uh, get well through martial arts. Yep. But I realized that the art that I was practicing at that time didn't fulfill everything that I needed. Yep. And there was no internet, so it was magazines, everything else. And I started to buy like the, the Bruce Lee books and the Danny Nasanto books. And, yep, yep getting Black Belt magazine from my news agent and everything else and inside Kung Fu and Karate. And I started reading Dan and Santos books and he started talking about cross training and he mentioned Thai boxers. And I thought, well, I, I, I realized I could, like I said, I could throw you, lock you, but I couldn't punch my way out of a paper bag. Mm -hmm. And I was really into fitness as well. So it was like, okay, these guys are really high, highly conditioned fighters. They're fit as hell. They yeah. can strike with everything elbows knees kicks you know they get used to getting hit they go standing grapple and i thought all right that's that's where i want to go to and uh luckily enough there was a guy called bob spore and bob was teaching in at birmingham university and i saw a, an interview in combat magazine so i phoned bob and i went can i come and train with you and we had gone like a house on fire and started training with bob and so like, i was doing the jiu-jitsu and i started to go oh, okay uh, I was leaning more towards the tie, saying my goodbyes to Steve after a few years. And I was cross-training the two for a while and it just didn't seem to work. Yeah. And then I started to, like, the, the thing was, even though I was training, I was still scared mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't address the knife thing. Yeah. And um, I started to research arts that, that, that basically were, were blade arts. Mm -hmm. And it tended to work over to more of the Southeast Asia side again. I mean, I know Thailand's in Southeast Asia and they have got weapons based arts, but yeah. look at what I was reading about, like a you know, Filipino scream, a Filipino martial arts and the Malaysian, Indonesian Silla arts. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was trying to find somewhere where I could kind of find a teacher in, in that. Um, so yeah, it went from like Jiu Jitsu going down into the, into the Thai boxing, I still yep. teach and train Thai boxing now after 30 years. Yep, yep. Still keeps his whole body and mind moving. Um, but uh, then I, 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 it's like anything, isn't it? If, if you're afraid of something and you keep on kind of like brushing over it, it's, it's, still, whenever, it's going to be with you forever. Yeah, for so sure. I, needed, I needed to address it. So I started to kind of like research Filipino and Thai, um, Malaysian, Indonesian arts that specialise in the blade. Was was there a moment when you realised that, again, getting back to that quote, which when I when I found it when I was when I was doing some research for the podcast, was perfection actually. So let's let's talk about that again. Uh, was there a moment when you realised that there was a difference between studying the martial arts over a twenty and thirty year term for your own perfection? against Anity, and again, we, we're going to talk yeah. about coaching yeah. stuff, yeah. when you realise yeah. it's different yeah. about yeah. preserving my life. Massive, here. massive difference, because it's, I think what, what you get, as much as you can try your best to recreate an adrenalised environment in the training area, wherever you want to call it, your dojo, your dojang, or, you know, your gelling gang, as much as you can try and put together some kind of adrenalised situations, I don't think anything compares to actually being on the street and doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, um, yeah, I, I knew straight away that, that, you know, being in, and, and one thing that was a big one for me was that 
adrenaline comes in, so you start getting tunnel visioned. And when you start getting tunnel visioned, you lose your peripheral. Okay. And then you lose the idea that his mate's going to glass you. Yeah. You know, or, or his missus is going to smash you around the back of the head with a, with a stiletto. Yeah. Um, so we, I don't think we figure in uh, an adrenalized state enough in, in, in the training areas. Um, so that was a big one. And also techniques. You know, on the perfection side, I think, you know, how many techniques have you learned over the years since you've been training, Kareem? Yeah, it's, you know, I've got a, I've got a note here that says hammer fist. And uh, obviously, right. we can go and talk about that later, but it's hundreds, if not thousands. Absolutely. Yeah. It must, yeah. Be, it must be. So how can it be self-defense when you've got to learn thousands of techniques? Is what I, I call it what technique syndrome. Yeah. Because suddenly, you, you know, you, it starts to kick off and then you've got that adrenaline start to kick off inside your body. And then you go, right, shall I engage or disengage? And then you start going, well, what techniques shall I use? Yeah. And by the time you've got, I always do it when I teach military guys and stuff like that. And they go, how many, how many ways have you been taught to, to um, pull the trigger? And they go, one way. Yeah. Yeah. It's... And do you know what I mean? They haven't been taught 10,000 variations on on how to block a jab. Yep. Do you know what I mean? It's like, the, 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 I mean, I've never shot a gun in my life, so I don't know, but I always like to, I think, I think the thing is that, you know, if you want to call, you know, these people call me a subject matter, subject matter expert in what I do. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, I think people will learn too many techniques and in a self-defense situation, I think you tend to, you get drawn in by adrenaline and you get a tunnel vision. And um, if you don't react well enough, the range changes very quickly, as I well know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you end up, you know, in a not a very good situation. Okay. So what was the, was the approach your, was your approach the, the first thing that was sort of born from the, that wanting to transition to, I need to start taking stuff out here or I didn't want to, I didn't know that the, the approach was just a, the approach was a mistake. I didn't look for it. Didn't search for it. It was a fact that one day I was teaching my time. I mean, you know, you got to remember that I've been training a long time and you know, I'm one, like I said, I'm one of these guys that's cross trained in many different arts and you know, I'm really into power development, mm -hmm. body mechanics. So I've been used to like throwing around big, heavy, heavy pickaxe handles to develop power and stuff like that. And um, I was teaching my Thai boxing class one day and I'm very enthusiastic when I teach. And one day I just, I wasn't feeling it at all. And I stopped the class. I went, guys, I went, can I just show you this? See, remember, remember I'm talking, I'm teaching. I used to get guys who, you know, were, were ring fighters. Yep. You know, I teach guys to a very good standard, you know, to, to, to compete. And I just stopped my Thai boxing class, guys. I went, let me show you these movements. So every time they were firing a punch, they, I, was, I was like destroying their punch with a... So it wasn't like a block. I was destroying their, their attack and then moving in with a counter. So that whatever they were throwing at me, I was just attacking that threat because it comes from a blade. Yep. The, the, blade, whatever, whatever, the blade cuts whatever you give it. Like I've showed you my body, you know, mm. it's in the hands of the professional who wants to do it. The big mark is the big scars from the top to bottom is the professional surgeon who saved my life. Of course. The, 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 you know, so the blade just does the job. So whatever attack you were giving me, what I get, because they always say in Southeast Asian arts, that whatever you can do with a blade or a stick, you can do empty hand. And uh, I just basically followed those principles. And... I showed the guys it and all the Thai boxers were all like, wow, this is great. And if you can, if you can convert people like that who are boxing and Thai boxing, yeah. who, who are used to getting hit and going, wow, this is different. And um, I went to see Chris, my teacher on the Sunday, this was a Thursday night in class on, on the Sunday. I went to see my, my, my teacher, Chris lives in Nottingham and I'm in Birmingham. So uh, Sunday was my, you know, my training day with him. And I told him about, how I'd shown the guys these, these set of movements. Again, they're not nothing new because they're universal movements done with a blade or a stick. Yeah. It's just, it's just the, the way that I 
delivered it was maybe different to how other people do it. And he went to me, he went, that is brilliant. Eddie Quinn's the approach. Yeah. If I had to name it, I'd still be trying to think of a name now. I'd probably go down the line. Yeah. So I'm so, I'm so indecisive anyway, you know what I mean? And um, he, he said to me, he went, that's brilliant. Eddie Quinn's the approach. And he went, go contact. There was a guy called Richie Grannon from Liverpool who was doing some filming in those days. Mm -hmm. He said, contact Richie Grannon and see if he'll film you. And I'm one of these people my entire life. I've always struggled with confidence. And I always have, you know, we've all got it. The good one, good cop, bad cop. And, you know, and I've always had ideas and always taught myself out of it. And I just, something felt right with this. I thought I'm going to run with this. And uh, phone Richard Grant and we messaged him and um, we agreed to pry something else. He'd come to Birmingham. And he filmed what was known as the approach, like a pilot film. Yep, yep. And I was completely, it was it was great and I got the footage back and I can actually see, I can, I can still picture Richard Grandin behind the camera yeah. doing this. Like, <laughs> like this. you could see him. You could, he, he was, I could see it. And we got, we got the footage back and I went to Chris's and we watched it. And uh, Chris said to me, goes, you know, the material is really good. You need to get this filmed, you know, put together properly into a package. Yeah. And luckily enough, one of my Silat brothers, John, who used to train with us, um, he used to work for the BBC, so he had loads and loads of cameras. And he had this big basement in his house. And he'd just got back from filming uh, Guru Danny Santo in Edinburgh. Oh, okay. um, uh, the, I think it was the definitive co co collection or something. So he'd had all the cameras. So we went to his, he basically went to his basement. It was me, Super Nige. And we filmed, um, we filmed uh, volume one, two, and three of the approach. Yeah. Put an advert in um, MAI, and uh, people started buying my DVDs. I was going like, <laughs> and they were just being, you know, all over the, literally all over the world. It was crazy. And then I was getting people going, "Would you come to Australia to do a seminar? Would you come to the US to do a seminar? Would you come to?" Thailand. Thailand was my first proper approach um, seminar. It was it was crazy from just having that one idea yeah. and not talking myself out of it and going, do you know what this feels right? Mm -hmm. To getting Richard Grannon to do the pilot, to filming the three films, to putting an advert in MAI, yeah. to people buying them and then liking it and then being invited for seminars. And then flying all over the world to teach. I was going, Jesus Christ. I'm this working class kid from Birmingham, you know, left school with no education, hated school, had no no inspirational teachers at school, nearly died, yeah. took up martial arts, and then 20 years down the line, here I am, and I'm teaching in bloody Australia. Without without sort of let's get a wee bit technical. Uh now, if people want to learn the approach, they, they go and they... Well, you don't... It's no DVDs anymore, is it? It's you got Roy Moore. Downloading stuff. You got Roy Moore. Uh, well, and if, you want, if you want it, you got... Well, you got, you got Roy Moore in, in Aberdeen. Absolutely. Uh, who, again, was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And Roy's, Roy's just a lovely guy. Uh, so I shout, out, I shout out to Roy as well. Uh, Roy's great. But let, 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 let's talk about what the approach is then. Like, without... Given, given it all away, just if, if, if I was to say, I was speaking to Eddie Quinn today where we're talking about his system and someone says, yeah. what is his system? What, what, what stripes does it involve? The approach I call, I was, my, my, my kind of like, if you like, sales pitch, it's a fast and effective method of self-defense that can be taught quickly. Um, it's basically using what the human body knows how to do naturally. Um, the the hammer strike if i just get myself a a pen bear with me yep so if you're not familiar with blades you know it's it's um i learned it from like what we call ice pick grip okay so th this motion is a stabbing motion yeah got the idea yep, yep. um but you can do it empty hand but the, the, like the geek in me was going, well, this is the same as throwing. Okay. This same movement is the same as throwing a ball. 
yep. if you're going to throw a ball, you're not going to just do that. You're going to let your whole body move and then the body transfers forward and then you release it. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I started to do was, as it evolved from blades, but I got to Perth Airport once. I done like a little world tour. I went from, I went uh, Middle East. I went to Thailand. I went to Perth, Australia. And when I was in the Middle East, I had some meetings with some security company, companies out there. So I had all these, these paraphernalia for, for the approach and security companies, everything else. And I went to Bangkok, taught in Bangkok, and then I, then I flew to Perth. And uh, when I got to Perth Airport, I got stopped by the, the customs as I, as, I, as I was going through. Yep. And I opened my bags up and I had all these bloody training blades in there <laughs> and all this paraphernalia from, from security companies in there. And bless them, you know, they were great. They let me through and they said, well, the DVDs that you've got in your suitcase, you're going to give them away, aren't you, Mr. Quinn? I went, that's correct. <laughs> and, and, and the techniques that you're going to teach, Mr. Quinn, they're going to, they're going to be restraint techniques, aren't they? I went, that's correct. Yeah. Bless them, they were really, really nice. I mean, I told them my story, what happened, and they were really great. I let me through. Yeah. But I just started to re- re- realise, I mean, I teach kids, of course. I never mentioned anything with, regarding the... Uh, the blade yeah. i turn the kids into the incredible hulk they'll do a hulk smash yep yep they they're giving it they they're giving it a thor hammer yeah of course Brilliant. you know what i mean yeah, so yeah. I, so I, I always relate the and it's gross motor skills it's not fine motor skills it's that kind of like the shit it's a fan and you've got to hit somebody really really quickly and hard yeah uh, and without thinking about 10,000 techniques that i always say you can either, if you hit preemptively and hopefully you've done the job and then you can escape. If not, you can move in, you can transition into elbows. You can transition to headbutts. But for me, it deals, it deals with that no man's land in the middle between you and me, that range where you're really going to shit yourself before it kicks off. Yep, yep, yep. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's the range where, I mean, that's the range where I don't think it is taught enough, understanding that space. Mm-hmm. So, and then I started to, well, well you know, like I said, I, I can't go around just relating it to blades or related it to throwing. And then I started to relate the footwork to, to walking. So as a human being, we know how to throw a ball. We all know how to walk. Yeah. Even the, and then so the, and we, I've got something, what we should call the approach 360. So you've got hammer strikes to in, in front, you've got hammer strikes behind, and you've got hammer strikes to the side. And literally it's, it's, it's more designed, if you like, for people who are not martial artists, mm-hmm. who haven't got 10, 20, 30 years to dedicate to it. Yeah. It's for someone who goes, I need to learn this pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. You, know, I, I've, you know, I've just got back from teaching a, a military team, um, but a base in, in, um, in the south of England, you know. They're a, they're a rapid response military unit so whenever there's a conflict and they need to get out there really quickly, you know, these are the guys who get shipped out. They haven't got the time or the budget to go and learn Taekwondo, Muay Thai, Sil- that they need, they need to learn something very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, that's pretty much where I, I fit in, if you like. It was only pure by accident because I'm a martial artist. But I had a, I had a, a, a police officer from the States about 10 years ago he said, he emailed me saying, thanks for the swift delivery of your DVDs. Uh, can I give you some feedback uh, how the approach fits into my role as a law enforcement officer? Okay. He said, I finally found a way to hit someone without breaking my hand. Let me tell you why that's important. I mean, I didn't have a clue. Honestly, God, in my kid's life, I didn't even think about this. He went, if I break, damage my hand in, a, in an arrest, if I need to now pull out a gun, bat and gas taser, you think about it. If the shit hits a fan, you've got to hit me, Karim. You're not going to hit me with your left hand unless you're left-handed. Yep, Under yep. stress, you're going to go, right, I need to hit this guy with, with my body strongest. So, of course, a police officer, if he does hit someone and then suddenly he gets a head, you know, you go to chin me, put my head down, you've just smashed your hand. Yep, yep. I mean, you and I have been training a long time. I still box now. I still hit pads now. I still hit the bag now. Yep. I've still caught, you know, recently caught, I went, oh my goodness me, that's 35 years down the line. Yeah. And I'm just, a, no, I'm just a guy who plays it. These guys put their lives on the line every day. Yeah. And he said, I've finally found a way about, of, of, of hitting someone without damaging my hand. 
that's so important. I, I anytime we, I've actually committed when when the world opens back up again. Uh, I've actually committed to going up to Aberdeen to visit Roy and uh, and actually oh, wonderful. do some training. Uh, but we, we certainly do we certainly do work on hammer fists uh, in our own own school. And one of the stories I tell all the time was, and, and you've just you've touched on it again. Uh, there's so many sort of really relevant stuff that you're touching on. Uh, Mike Tyson coming out of a nightclub back in the 90s or 80s, I think, and punched somebody. Now, this is the, the baddest man on the planet type thing. World heavyweight boxer yeah. broke his hand. Wait, if, if Mike Tyson Absolutely. is going to break his hand on somebody's skill, there's a yeah. high likely I'll break my hand or a student would break your hand. So yes, the hammer fist... Uh, the effectiveness of it and not only delivering a blow but keeping yourself safe as well. Delivered correctly. Yeah. Okay. You know, you know, it's like anything, you know, that I think it's not just the martial arts. I think it's every industry, but it, you know, it can be very bitchy and it's like, well, you know, the hammer fist is easy to block and all this kind of stuff. And I've, if I don't mind, I've, I've just filmed uh, headbutts and hammers yep. uh, over the weekend and I, and, the Approach 360 film, um, you know, that's sold all over the world. And I've had lots of people questioning me saying, you know, uh, asking questions about the, the hammer fist is easy. Of course, it's very easy if someone stands in front of you and just does this. It's yeah. how you deliver that. It's how, it's, how you, it's how you transport your body into the hit. I want to move all of me into you. It doesn't matter what I'm going to hit you with, whether it could be a head, it could be with an elbow, it could be with a punch, it could be with a kick, it could be with a knee. I want to be able to learn how to transfer all my mass into that target yeah. with whatever I've got. That Because time and distance dictates what technique I'm going to use, of course. I'm not going to headbutt you when you're four foot away. Yeah. So I'm going to do some flying headbutt. Yeah. But if, if even from a close proximity like this, rather than just dropping the head, I want to be able to transfer that from my feet and through and, and out. Yeah. So, yeah, hammer fists are great, but you've got to learn how to move your my, my teacher calls it moving your kit, move your body. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a new program, a uh, program then. Uh, Headbutts and hammers. Headbutts and hammers. Yeah, well, tell us a wee bit about that. Well, you think about it. Every time you move, every time you step, the headbutt is always available. Yep. Whenever I move my body, I, if I'm, if I, we call feet. We go from the feet to the core, to the big four, which is your elbows and your knees, led by the head, and the hit travels on the breath. So whenever you step and move, the head is all of, always available. And I filmed the 360, the approach 360 three years ago, and that's pretty much sold all over the world. And this is like the, 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 the next stage of it. And um, like I said to you at the start of the, the podcast, you know, I've had no choice but to really give my online training a little bit more love and attention. Yeah. And, um, you know, all, all these projects that I've had on the back burner for ages. Yep. You know, I, I've been able to film, you know, I brought out a solo training um, SILAP course over the, over the summer. Again, because we're training, you know, lots of people are isolated. Mm -hmm. People need to train. Yep. You know, it's, it's kept my head relatively straight for the past 35 years. Yep. By, by, by moving my body, you know, I'm, I'm 55 next birthday and I'm you know and I'm I, I you know I still want to be able to do this till the day that I die yeah of course you know there's guys in the 20s 30s thinking they're too old yes. you know what I mean and you know at the moment with everybody working from home you know the amount of people that I've you know my personal trainer I have, I have a PT three times a week but I did pre-covid but one of the guys there one of the personal trainers at the gym Kyle he's had seven people that he knows kill themselves over the lockdown period. Yeah. Seven people. Yeah. I think, you know, and I think, you know, with the likes of us and what we do through training really brings 
out and releases the endorphins that we need to to keep this healthy as yeah. well as keeping the kit healthy so yeah i mean i you know i brought out an, an approach headbutt similar it's not i done a pre-sale a couple of days ago but you know my my uh my silat fitra solo training just to keep people Moving. doing something yeah for sure you know for sure uh, so it, it's it, it's 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 worrying times but you know especially with people working from home at the moment too you know they're working from home from like 7 30 till six o'clock at night and then because it's dark they're not going out yeah it's 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 playing havoc on people's mental health it's uh i think it's been one of the things that has been most negative about all of this uh over and above the actual virus and everything that that entails but the there has i started the podcast at the beginning of the 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 sort of pandemic back in, in March time, I believe. And there hasn't been a guest that I've had on. And they've all been sort of martial artists or uh, sort of health professionals. There hasn't been a guest who hasn't spoke about the importance of of movement and exercise and... Absolutely. Doing, doing something. Uh, I was in the park this morning at seven o'clock training. Yep, brilliant. Pitch black in the park, you know. Yep. It's just, just it's what I do. The I think the I think that's where Zoom and and again we're we're recording this podcast over Zoom today uh, in different completely different parts of the the country. It's I think yeah. if you embrace it, and again yeah. back to what we were talking about with with, with, with Matt and he's trying to educate the the instructors of the UK and and further afield about the importance of actually embracing this technology not just yeah. for us but we have a duty of care to our students as well and to yeah. try and offer them as many avenues as we can to continue doing yeah what we think yeah yeah, yeah. what yeah. the doctors now think they should be doing keeping themselves yeah. active and, and mentally strong absolutely i mean just people are, people are just i think people are very sad now I mean, every, you know you can just see it in people's eyes yeah yeah, you know, there's like a sadness around, and it's 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 painful. It's so painful. Let me let me ask you one more question, uh, Eddie, before I, I I let you go today. Uh, as a, someone who let, I want to take martial arts and self defence out of it, as far as people not being able to attend courses and stuff, but. We're coming up to the winter sort of nights. What what tips do you have for if you were to say if someone was watching this or listening to this and they hadn't done anything, what can we do to keep ourselves a wee bit safer until we learn the approach or until we start training in martial arts? What's the everyday stuff that people might still there's so much available now, but people don't think about it. What what's, yeah. what's your advice and tips on just generally keeping yourself safe or safer well i suppose at, at the moment nobody's going anywhere anyway well, of course <laughs> yeah 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 do you know what i mean it's like unless uh, your milkman's gonna attack you <laughs> absolutely <laughs> um for for me really it's it's like anything isn't it you know i'm a 54 year old uh, martial artist who does teach self-defense and i'm I don't put myself in those situations to go. Uh, awareness is 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 the big key for me. That if you're going to go somewhere that you know there's going to be trouble, you know there's a there's a, you can see a group of guys in the corner, load of street kids. Like, you know you can see you know you go to a pub where you know there's trouble. You just don't go there. I I don't I don't put myself in situations where I know that I'm going to get myself or could get myself into some kind of um into some kind of beef really so you know you've got awareness you've got avoidance there's got to be a good talker talking your way out of it of course which is uh, rated by the way it's high it's high oh, absolutely and being a being a good runner <laughs> yeah 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 and if all that fails you need you know that's when you need to hit them really really hard Indeed. um but you know 
I, I suppose for me at this stage of my life, it's more about just keeping the kit healthy mm-hmm. and moving them and, and, and monitor myself too. Do you know what I mean? Monitor. It's very easy to get, to get, allow yourself to get drawn in and, you know, because we're not going out and not teaching as much and, you know, what we eat, what we drink, you know, I, I make sure that I do something every day. Yeah. Uh, but to answer your question, really, I think awareness and avoidance are the, are the big ones. Just don't put yourself in those situations. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we can take the magic beans from any situation. I've been on the floor dying and with blood coming out of every orifice and unable to breathe and being on death's door and still pulled myself through it. Not on my own, but, you know, with the help of other people. But, you know, there is a, I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel for everybody. So the, um, the, the final message for today is to, is a wonderful message, is to look for the magic beans. Look for the magic beans. <laughs> yeah, and may, and may every day be a happy one. Absolutely. We, we, going back to what you said right at the beginning about every day being a blessing, we, we don't Yeah. We don't have that ability a lot of the time to, to look at, just look from outside your situation, really. Yeah. Attitude, to be honest. Got a second chance, didn't I, when I was 18, and, you know, it made me realise just, just the, the beauty of life. Yeah. Um, people don't. People. I think unless you've been in situations that have been life-threatening, I think we just take what we've got for granted. Yeah. And for of sure. course, I get. Of course, I get bad days. Every, you know, we, I'm a human being. You know. But I, I, I like to think. I, I remember when I was just starting to see my wife, and her, her uncle was dying, and we went to say goodbye to him, and he was dying of cancer, and he was a lovely, soft-spoken Irishman. And I remember going to say goodbye to him and I held his hand and uh, I mentioned this on the podcast I've done the other week and I carry it with me all the time and I held his hand and this poor bugger was dying. He was like five stones soaking wet and he went, may every day be a happy one, Eddie. Yeah. And you know, you got a man dying there and he's tell, he tells me that may have, have sent me cold now. Yeah. May, have, may every day be a happy one. And uh, you know, I like to. I, like, I, I think you got two choices in the morning, haven't you, Karim? You either wake up and you're sad, or you wake up and you're happy, and you 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 move your body and you fuel it, and you give thanks to what you've got. And you know, I'm blessed with two kids and a lovely wife and a great little. No, little I'm a I'm a dog man, so you know I've got my dog, and uh, I'm very grateful for what I've got. And I can get up in the morning. I'm healthy and I can move, and you know, and I can hopefully make a difference to people's lives brilliant so you know brilliant Eddie that's 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 a that's a beautiful place for us to for us to finish with that lovely message there uh, okay everybody uh, Eddie Quinn an absolute gentleman sir so thank you so much for for coming on oh bless you mate thank you for inviting me too it's been great I've really enjoyed it thank you thank you so much so uh, Eddie Quinn everybody thanks Eddie thank you thank you thank you